this very uh, good morning, we are joined by the, uh, in here we have a Professor Tom Skinberg and Professor uh, Jimmy Ashidiki and Dr. Kurata Ayuni as our uh, speakers for today's uh, event. This event is entitled State of Emergency in the Contemporary World, which is a very interesting topic that we have uh, witnessed because of emergence of the COVID-19 pandemics. Uh, COVID-19 pandemics caused the different responses by the government. Some uh, government introduced stricter measures to combat the, uh, combat the pandemic and some others have followed more uh, re relaxed rules on how to combat the virus, and this is uh, this uh, circumstances and post uh, recent pandemic uh, causes uh, legal scholars and political uh, scientists to argue what the extent of the and the limitation of powers of the governments or the executive powers during the emergency two situations. This is a very relevant topic, especially for Indonesia because Indonesia is prone to the many disaster. As we have witnessed in 2004, we have one of the largest uh, tsunami that we encountered in the history. And uh, at the time, uh, the government introduced several measures and uh, uh, policies to uh, help the disaster, help to overcome the disaster. And this event is broadly organized by the Faculty of Law, University of Indonesia, along with the International Institute for Democracy and Electoral Assistance, or International IDEA, as well as uh, with the Center for Constitutional Law Study, Faculty of Law, Universities of Indonesia, and Center for International Law uh, Studies, Faculty of Law, Universities of Indonesia. Allow me to introduce myself. My name is Rizky Banyolam Permana. I am a general lecturer at the Department of International Law, Universities of Indonesia. I will be uh, hosting this event uh, for today's uh, sessions. So before we start, uh, I will invite uh, or uh, remarks by our dean, Professor uh, Edmond Makarim, to uh, present your opening speech. Time is yours. Assalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. Om Swastiastu, Namo Buddhaya, Salam Kebajikan, Selamat Pagi, Good Morning. Professor Tim, Tom Ginsberg, Professor Jim Lee Asidiki, Chairperson of the Center for Constitutional Law Studies, Mr. Nofriza Bahar, and Chairperson for the Center for International Law Studies, Mr. Hadi Rahmat Purnama. And all the distinguished guests who are attending this seminar, both in person in Depok, Indonesia, or virtually from all over the world. On behalf of the Faculty of Law Universitas Indonesia, I welcome all of the speakers and participants of this hybrid seminar. This is the one of the first international events held offline since the pandemic has started. Our campus has just recently tried to shift the activities offline again. It is challenging to switch back our activity back to normal life prior to pandemic, but nevertheless, we must try it. It was undisputed pandemic has changed our life, both in public and in private, including on how we live in our modern society. Today's seminar topic is truly important as we are heading towards post-COVID recovery. There are some of aspects of state governance that we should reflect on. Throughout the pandemic period, many states have introduced different measures and policies to handle the emergency, including in Indonesia, mandatory vaccination and movement tracking through the application. These policies are often questioned and criticized by civil society and academic people. Moreover, in Indonesia past practice, there are an allegations and concerns that the data collected through application is prone to risk or even reported has been breached. This raises que this raise questions against the action of the government to what extent government authority is necessary and justifiable in the states of emergency. When we reflect on the root of this pandemic, there are more questions that left unanswered until now. Whether the pandemic is bioengineered weapons or whether there is an involvement of state negligence that caused the pandemic. There should be a legal responsibility pursuant to this pandemic outbreak that harmed the world and changed how we live every day. 
distinguished guests and speaker. I will not further delay the main event by answering my previous questions because it is the function of this panel and this floor to discuss it. Finally, with Bismillahirrahmanirrahim, I open this event and I wish you to have a fruitful discussion in the upcoming hours and pro Professor Ginberg, I wish you have a pleasant stay in Indonesia. Thank you very much. Assalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. Waalaikumsalam. Thank you, Dean Edmond, for your uh, opening remarks. Ladies and gentlemen, uh, I will uh, quickly introduce this uh, morning's panel. But first being, uh, I will introduce uh, you to some of uh, our speakers here. First, uh, I will invite Professor Tom Gisbert to go to the stage. Please give applause. And second, I will uh, invite uh, Dr. Kureta Yuni to go to the stage. Please give applause for her. And lastly, but not the least, I uh, please give applause to Professor Jim Lee Asyidiki who are appear before the screen. Okay. Okay. Uh, firstly, uh, because. Uh, uh, this is because of the change of situation. Uh, we understand that Professor Jim Lee Ashidiki has uh, a special uh, session within the parliament. So uh, for this session, I will uh, switch the speaker. Uh, so beforehand, I will introduce the house rules first. Uh, firstly, for the Q&A session, will be conducted after the session. So for uh, those of uh, distinguished participants that have uh, uh, questions, uh, we'll you, uh, you can do that after the presentation. Or for those of you who are attending uh, the in the Zoom, you can just ask uh, it through the uh, Zoom chat. Okay, I will introduce the uh, spe uh, main speaker here. Uh, first, uh, the first speaker is Professor Jimmy Ashidiki. He is the professor of the constitutional law in University of Indonesia, and he published uh, many, many books in uh, uh, Bahasa Indonesia and English. And the uh, second speaker is the Professor Tom Gisberg. He is the Leo Spitz Distinguished Service Professor of International Law, Ludwig and Hilda Wolf Research Scholar, Professor of Political Science. And his last publication, he has published many, many public publications in international law and constitutional law. And his last publication is uh, the book uh, titled uh, Democracy and International Law. And uh, the last speaker is the Dr. Uh, Kurata Ayuni. She is the lecturer and the researcher at the Center for Constitutional, Constitutional Law Studies. And she just finished her doctoral studies in the topic of state of emergency in Indonesia. Please again give applause for the uh, following panel. Okay, uh, without further ado, I will invite Professor Jim Lee Ashidiki to present his uh, opening uh, presentation. Please, uh, Pak Jim Lee, tempat dan waktu kami persilakan. Okay, thank you. Assalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. Good morning for everyone, especially uh, I would uh, welcome Professor Tom Ginsberg from uh, uh, Chicago. Uh, welcome to Jakarta, Tom. And uh, I hope that we can meet tomorrow morning. Uh, before you leave, uh, very sorry that I cannot be uh, physical presence with you today because I have uh, in my status of members of the MPR, we have very special sessions today. So I, I cannot get rid of being in the parliament uh, also at nine o'clock in the morning. So. I would uh, meet my my my, my time uh, five to ten minutes to to welcome you and uh, to brief some uh, related to the topic we are going to discuss today. And uh, thank you also for Professor Satyari Nanto, Professor Anna Erliana, and of course uh, Dr. Kurota Ayun uh, as the speaker. Also, I see in the in the Zoom uh, monitor Adi Aman from uh, India International Network, and dear participants, all ladies and gentlemen, I would like to thank you 
that we have uh, uh, this gathering to share uh, information and opinion regarding the state of emergency, how our country, constitutional and democratic countries respond to the problem of uh, state of emergency, especially during the COVID-19 outbreak in the last two years. Uh, <clears throat> COVID-19 pandemic outbreak uh, since 2020 that until today in 2022 has not yet uh, ended can be considered the greatest disaster ever happened affecting human life in the whole world of our generation. It caused not only crisis in healthcare, but also socioeconomic depression and even global politics. There is no debate that the outbreak is very serious national and global disaster, the danger of which should be handled by every constitutional government in the world with unusual, with abnormal or unorthodoxy constitutional measures. Normal law should be applied only for normal condition, normal time. While during the abnormal condition, the abnormal law should prevail. Otherwise, there will be no justice at all. Indonesia is the fourth most populated countries in the world after China, India, and the United States with total population more than 274 million people. Among the four, Indonesia infected only a lowest number of cases, but among the 10 Southeast Asian countries, Indonesia has the largest cases. By 20, May 2020, the death toll in Indonesia already reached 1,391. While in the Philippines, as second, only 873 deaths, and the third is Malaysia, 115 deaths. How Indonesia government responds to this outbreak? As we know, the first recorded case outside China was confirmed in Thailand on the 13 January 2020, and just on the 30 January. WHO reported 7,818 total confirmed cases worldwide, with the majority in China and other countries outside China. On the date, WHO declared the outbreak of public health emergency of international concern. In Indonesia, the first case suspected was found on the 2nd March but was announced negative in the 13th March, 2020. One more case found on in the 6th March was not announced whether it was positive or negative, that people believe it was the first positive case in Indonesia. Ladies and gentlemen, on uh, the 10th March, we actually sent a letter to President Joko Widodo using the press urging the president to scale up the country's emergency response mechanism in containing the outbreak by among other measures declaring national state of emergency president donald trump of usa declared national state of emergency on the 13 march and president joko widodo on the same date announced only announced the establishment of COVID-19 task force led by the head of National Board of Disaster Management and issued a special regulations without any formal declaration of national emergency. Only on the 13th April, the next month, he declared COVID as a national disaster, but not emergency disaster. The declaration was based on national disaster law and health quarantine, quarantine law 2018. But the declaration of special regulation were not related at all 
with the state of civil emergency and emergency power based on national emergency law or state danger law of 1959 and Article 12 of the 1945 constitutions as the only article in Indonesian constitution dealing with the state of danger or the state of emergency. Based on these two laws, the national management of COVID in Indonesia is officially organized by two institutions. There is the Ministry of Health and National Board of Disaster Management. Sometimes there will be different announcements made by these various ministries and officials involved, and sometimes there are some disputes between central government and local government in handling the outbreak. The central government several times show concern about economic activity that has to be protected and ask the people to stay in peace with COVID-19. That the tight policy will be loosened and all modes of public transportation return to operation for business purposes seen to May 2020 until now. Despite of the facts, that the number of cases are still increasingly found everywhere until now. Now, I would like to uh, uh, conclude that why the emergency power enshrined in the constitution is not used in handling the COVID-19 outbreak in Indonesia. Because in Indonesian history, This emergency power has several times been misused both by the old or the regime under presidency of Sukarno as well as the new order regime under the presidency of Suharto. During the reform era today, although the laws may regulate such contents needed for unusual state conditions, such as national disaster management, crisis of finance system, or disease outbreaks. No one of those laws refer their establishment to the Articles of State Emergency in 1945 Constitution. Of course, in practice, not many people would waste the time to questions on the constitutionality of government actions against the COVID-19 outbreaks, since most people assume that salus populi suprema lex esto, that the safety of the people is the real highest law. The government takes any actions not by the rule of the law and the rule of the constitutions. Rather, the government gives advice, directions, and instructions only by good faith political will, and direct discretions. Therefore, I would say 19, COVID-19 outbreak from 9, 2020 until 2020 today, in the case of Indonesia, is managed under the emergency de facto, but not the jure. This is, I would conclude about Indonesian constitutional experience in response to the outbreak of nine COVID-19. But what the lesson can be learned from these situations that uh, ladies and gentlemen, we have to uh, emphasize the important for the lawyer, the important for the faculty of law to uh, emphasize the importance of the emergency law that the constitutional constitutional law should be divided into two that is constitutional law in normal times then constitutional law in abnormal time and i would appreciate that uh, studying from last year in the university of indonesia especially in the faculty of law that the uh, hukum tata negara darurat or emergency constitutional law become a new subjects both for the 
program of undergraduate also in the program of graduate studies and i hope that all faculties of law in indonesia uh, should follow what is already initiated by the faculty of law of university of indonesia that all the students and the lawyers indonesian lawyers should know how to differentiate between constitutional law in normal times and constitutional law in emergency condition because indonesia is one of very pregal pregil uh, uh, natural environments country in the world because indonesia is uh, the largest maritime country composed of 17000 island why we have so many islands because in the history there are so many disasters in indonesian experience including how danau toba was created it is big eruptions thousand years ago and also so many experience like tsunami in aceh 2003 and then liquefactions in palu 2018 that this country is very fragile that so many uh unnormal conditions may happen that the uh, constitutional response legal response to the different situation abnormal situations should be handled uh, smoothly through regulation through uh, uh, system constitutional systems of emergency law so because of that uh besides natural disasters we have also today facing a new world new uh, potentials of uh, 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 disasters in the world we are facing uh, because of the potenti- potentials of world war the third world war hopefully it will not happen but as we understand what is happening today in south china sea what is happening today between russia and uh, the allies with the western uh, uh, countries uh, european west european countries uh, we are facing a very very uh, dangerous uh, future in the until toward the mid uh, century of the 21st century if we compare to the mid uh, middle of uh, 20th century after the first uh, world war and then great depressions in 1930s uh, and then second world war and it had uh, changed the world order very fundamentally in the middle of the uh, 20th century uh, we are now today facing a similar uh, potential for a big change yeah in the middle of the 21st century uh, 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 because of this uh, two two years two years long outbreak of covid-19 and then uh, there is uh, technological disruptions everywhere especially in the ICT internet of things and the third is the potentiality of third world war uh, that will change everything that all the lawyer legal studies should prepare how to res- respond to the problems of change uh, fundamental change happening in our future based on our experience in responding to the outbreak of covid-19 i hope the unorthodoxy in law making unorthodoxy in law uh, uh, implementation and unorthodoxy in law uh, uh, enforcement should be understood very well by uh legal scholars i think this is what i would like to share with you uh professor tom and 
dan Dr. Kurota Ayun and all dear participants. I'm again would say very sorry that I cannot uh, join uh, until the end of this meeting of this uh, uh, discussions uh, because I have another program in the parliament. Thank you very much. See you, Tom, for tomorrow. Assalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. Assalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. Please give applause to Professor Jimli Ashidiki for his excellent presentation. Terima kasih Pak Jimli, Professor Jimli. Cukup ya, terima kasih ya. Thank you. Uh, okay. Yes. Okay. Now, uh, I, if I may, I will conclude uh, uh, the, the first uh, speaker with uh, some of points that I have captured. First, we, we should remind that the applicability of law in normal time has to be differentiated in abnormal time. Therefore, it is, uh, therefore the state of emergency is important to, to be considered by uh, legal scholars. And, and it is interesting that uh, Professor Jim Lee stated us, even though we are in Indonesia particularly, uh, is prone to disaster and other risks, cyber, uh, geological, political, war, biological, and others, we, uh, the, the subject of the emergency constitutional law is still under study, even in the master's degree, postgraduate, or even uh, in bachelor study. And this is a good initiation. Uh, this pandemic has taught us many lessons, including how to reinforce the legal education to be more prepared with the upcoming risks. Okay, uh, now uh, I, I should remind you all again that uh, if you have any, uh, the, the Q&A session will be held after uh, all the panelists have presented their uh, presentation. And, but you can ask uh, in the chat room if you have any questions that needs to be addressed. And this event is also uh, is streamed live on YouTube. Uh, uh, should you have, uh, should you need to see this uh, session again, you can uh, all, uh, follow our YouTube at Fakultas Hukum UI in YouTube. Again, uh, I. Uh, Without further ado, I shall uh, welcome the second speaker, Professor Tom Skinsberg, to uh, present his presentation. Please, welcome. Thank you. Shall I go? Uh, yeah, yeah, feel free. And then I have to ask you with the slides. <laughs> yes. Slide Okay, is this working? Yes. Well, thank you very much for welcoming me. It's such an honor to be here. Um, honor to of course, be here even virtually with Professor Jim Lee, who I've known about for more than two decades. He's very famous as one of the greatest jurists, judicial statesmen, certainly in Asia and maybe the world. So it's a real honor to be on a panel with him. And Dr. Karat, uh, uh, I'm also glad to meet you. Uh, Dean Edmund, Professor Nofrizal, thank you everyone for welcoming me here. I also, before I start, want to acknowledge that the University of Indonesia and the University of Chicago are connected. We're connected by one person, which is my former student, Prambudya, who's here. <laughs> Thank you for coming, too. So I want to follow up on what Professor Jim Lee was talking about, states of emergency and how they connect with the problem of the pandemic. You know, you could see the pandemic as a kind of experiment in which it hit all of the countries at the same time, and we can look and compare their reaction. And one of the things we can compare is how did they deal with it legally? How did they use the emergency, constitutional emergency, statutes? Um, how did the legal response work? And was it effective? So let's go to the first slide. When you talk about emergency, it's a very old problem in law that goes back to the Romans. And in some ways, we still use the framework that the Romans came up with. The Romans had this phrase uh, or this institution called the dictatorship. Nowadays we say dictatorships are bad, but a dictatorship in the Roman sense was not seen as bad. What they meant is that when something bad was threatening the city, uh, invasion of the barbarians, the Germans were coming, they would say, look, we have to suspend the normal law and we will hire a dictator. And the dictator has all powers. He can do anything he wants, but only for a limited period, six-month period. 
And usually it would be a retired general, and that person would come, and they would save the city, and then they'd go back to their farm. And this was a regular part of Roman rule. It happened hundreds of times, um, and it was effective. There were certain principles legally that we still use. First of all, you, the rule was they could only have a dictator when it was necessary, and the determination of whether it was necessary was not done by the executive. It was done by the Senate. So you were separating the determination of an emergency from the person who would have power, which was seen as being really important because otherwise we have the risk that someone would declare an emergency for fake reasons for their own power. The other rule was that this person had all power, but only for a certain limited period till the emergency was over or maximum six months, one year in some periods. So that's interesting. They were able to enforce those limits. They never had the situation where someone declared the emergency power and then kept it beyond the time period. So this, in a way, is the origin of the legal institution of a state of emergency, the Romans. Normal law applies. Then we have a crisis we have a special legal regime, like Professor Jim Lee was talking about. Now, after the Romans you know, faded away, this institution also was not used much. But in the medieval period, or the um, early modern period, scholars begin to debate a, a question. Again, Professor Jim Lee brought this up. Can the law really constrain the state of emergency? Can the law really govern? Or is there some sort of black hole, if you will, where there's just somewhere where the law runs out and it cannot constrain? And, and you know, in the Western tradition, John Locke is actually well known for the second position. He said there's certain powers which are prerogative powers of the monarch, and they just can't be constrained. They're not subject to law. Law comes from the king and parliament. But the king himself cannot be constrained with regard to certain things, including emergency. On the other hand, Machiavelli, who was a, the Italian thinker, was working in a system of republics. And of course, the leaders there were elected for life, but they were still elected. They were subject to the city. And so he thought that the law could constrain. And so we have this ongoing debate. Can law control emergency power? And I think it's still relevant to us today. And the COVID situation is kind of a test. Next slide. There's a debate in the literature, actually a debate at the University of Chicago Law School. So, um, you know, if you, if you follow the Roman principles, we have modern principles, which are equivalent, which says basically that law can constrain, the law can restrict emergency by saying you have to show that it's truly necessary. It would be for a limited period, like most constitutional states of emergency have a limited period, that emergency measures can't be applied in a discriminatory fashion. You can't use emergency to say, you know, only the people of this tribe will be punished versus this other tribe. And most importantly, in our modern period, there would be judges overseeing the state of emergency, making sure that it's not abused. So this is kind of the conventional view, it's my view. But my colleague who wrote the book on the right, Eric Posner, wrote it with Adrian Vermeule, who's a very well-known conservative scholar at Harvard now, used to be at Chicago. They have this uh, book called The Executive Unbound, which says that basically all modern government is executive government. Executive power nowadays is very hard to constrain. And in particular, they think emergency rule can be, you know, we just have to trust the executive with political constraints, not legal constraints. They're on the side of John Locke. And so, well, this is two competing positions. We have evidence now from COVID. Let's investigate. Let me have the next slide if I can. One bit of support for their view is... Um, the work of the very famous German jurisprude, Carl Schmitt. Carl Schmitt um, is very famous for being the theorist of the Nazi regime. You see him on the left there. Um, and, but his ideas are really important, and we continue to read him and wrestle with him. 
and specifically with regard to emergency, he had a theory of sovereignty where he said, who is sovereign in any constitutional order? It's the person who can decide if there's an emergency. You have normal law, and if someone can say, no, we're moving into the state of emergency, that is the true sovereign power. And he thought it could not be constrained. He's on the side of Vermeule and Posner and Locke. There's a, the law runs out. It can't constrain. One example is actually this fellow on the right, which is Viktor Orban, the prime minister of Hungary. And he has been well known for sort of taking over the Hungarian political system. When the COVID hit, he got the parliament to give him emergency power where he could do anything he wanted, even if it was in violation of law through decree. So now presidential decrees were higher than law. And in a way, that's saying that he's kind of the sovereign, not the parliament. And that state of emergency continues today. He still has that power two years later. Um, and of course, he's used, he, he's very, very strong leader. So that's the risk, I think, of COVID. If you believe the Carl Schmitt position, COVID would lead to people taking more power than they need, keeping it, maybe never giving it back. And then we would have a dictatorship in the modern sense, someone who just is dominating the political system. So that's the fear. Next slide. Okay, so I want to first uh, explain my method, which is generally I, I look at lots of, I'm trying to look at every country. And it, what we did is we did a survey of all the different countries in the world. What does their constitution say about emergency rule? And then what happened? And for this, I draw on this project of mine, the Comparative Constitutions Project. This figure just shows you sort of the spread of written constitutions in the world as one part of the data. So you see this line on the bottom is time. And uh, the, the dark line, which goes up from 1800 to, oh, to 2020, uh, is the number of countries in the world, right? Number of countries in the world has expanded greatly with decolonization, almost 200 countries in the world. The line with the dashes is the number of countries that have a written constitution. And you could see that by about 1900, those two lines come together. Every country, with two or three exceptions, has a written constitution or something we can say is equivalent. And um, the other thing about the constitutions, the formal written constitutions in this project, is that they come in waves. You see the bars here are the number adopted in any given year. And it's not uniform. Constitutions tend to come in big bunches. 1850 was the so-called springtime of nations in Europe. After World War I, after World War II, decolonization, Cold War. Big groups of constitutions are written together. And one of the things we learned in this project is constitutions written around the same time look very similar. So there are trends in all kinds of things including in emergency powers. Next slide. So what do they say? Um, well, the first thing I want to show you on the right is the number of constitutions or the percentage of constitutions that deal with emergencies. The first written constitution for a nation, nation state is the United States. We don't have a state of emergency. It doesn't say anything about it. But over time, we've seen a great trend. So you go from almost none to now more than 80%, 90% of constitutions written. Say something about a state of emergency. That means law is trying to constrain emergency. Countries are trying to do so. And they tend to adopt the principles, certain common principles, in these clauses on emergency. So, for example, you see... Um, what is, the, what is the basis on which we can declare a state of emergency? You can't just do it for nothing. You need to have some showing. The most common is war. If there's a war, well, that generally that's the paradigm of a state of emergency. That goes back to the Romans. Um, internal security disturbances. Natural disasters aren't mentioned very much. And I think this is important for Indonesia since we've just heard that's a very likely state of that's going to happen, it's probably much more likely Indonesia will suffer natural disaster than a foreign invasion uh, or a war. Um, 
And the other thing is that very few of these clauses mention epidemics or financial crises. The constitutions were written in the 20th century, but the 21st century problems are different. They're likely to be pandemics, natural disasters, and financial crises. Some mention them, but not so common. These clauses tend to, as um, suggested by the literature, demand that emergency measures be taken by law, that they be under law, that there be certain rights which could not be suspended in the case of emergency. For example, even if it's an emergency, we can't torture people uh, and we can't discriminate against people. So those things tend to be listed in constitutions. And they all most always have limits on time. The emergency will last for six months. If, you, if the actual crisis goes longer, you need to have some oversight to extend it usually going back to the Congress. If the executive declares the emergency, it lasts 14 days or a month or six months, but then they have to go back and get approval for the extension. So that's obviously an attempt to constrain emergency power by law. Next slide. I should note that this is also part of the international human rights world. This is the Universal Declaration, and it says, and the International Covenant also has requirements that emergencies have to be officially proclaimed that there be a notice of derogation, which is a notice to the relevant international body that we know there's an emergency, we know we're bound to uh, protect these rights, but certain rights we must suspend. And you can imagine what those might be. You might have to suspend freedom of movement during COVID, for example, um, or freedom of speech if someone was going to pr produce false information about COVID. So you can suspend those rights. You have to inform the uh, international bodies and that you can only do that to the extent strictly necessary. Okay, next slide. All right, now, what actually happened in COVID? A first point is that when the COVID first hit, some countries happened to have law in place that was ready for it, and some countries did not. And so that meant that there was immediately rule of law problems. If you were a strict rule of law person and the law wasn't already ready for COVID, well, we would have had immediately the government could not act. They would have to go to the legislature, get a law passed. In some countries, that's really hard. Um, and a good example actually is Taiwan, which for a while had by far the best response of any country in the world. In the first year, I think Taiwan had seven deaths in the entire country, a very small number. And this is because it was an island, but also because they took very good steps. Their vice president was an epidemiologist, a public health person, and they stopped travel immediately. They um, prevented school groups from gathering. And some of those things they ordered immediately were actually not supported by existing law. But what Taiwan did is they went within two weeks to the legislature to get retroactive uh, blessing for the steps they had taken, retroactive measures. So if you're a strict rule of law person, you say, well, they did something wrong. But if you think about it sort of from the spirit of the law, they did something right. They, tr they knew what they had to do. They violated it formally, but immediately got proper supervision. And I think that's an important perspective. We can't be slaves to the law to to the imaginations of the prior legislators, if they've given us enough tools to fight the particular crisis we, we confront. On the other hand, if we do have to do something new, we have to get legislative uh, validation of it as soon as feasible, and Taiwan did this. Italy also, you may remember, Italy was one of the early countries in Europe that had a big number of cases around Bergamo, and they suspended many rights by decree, but the Constitution says rights can only be suspended by law. Eventually, they went and they got the law. Um, and then Ghana also had a similar kind of thing. So in many countries, they weren't, didn't have the legal tools. The law ran out. Does this prove that those uh, Schmidt people are correct? Next slide. Well, um, I want to... You know, I, th I think the answer there is quite clearly no. That's what I'm saying. That that just because the law isn't runs out doesn't mean that the law does not control and cannot constrain. If you have a practice that they have to go to the legislature 
then that would mean that would limit their steps they would take in the first place because they know they must justify it. They wouldn't do things that are completely crazy. One of the claims of the executive power people is that inherently in modern government, the executive must respond to these things alone. It has advantages in information. They can see everything that's going on and in speed. You, you don't have to go all the way to the legislature, just let the executive do its thing. And um, that's the claim that Posner and Vermeule make. One of the things I did then, after looking at these um, introductory things, is we looked at every country's COVID response. And we were asking, was it led by the executive? What was the role of the legislature, if anything? And did courts have any role to play? Was the executive unbound or was the executive actually constrained by the other institutions in the constitutional system. And what we found was that the executive was not really the leading actor in many countries, or if it was, it was highly constrained by the other actors in the constitutional system. The separation of powers was really important, and courts in particular played a very important role in COVID response in many countries. Some examples of what they did. First of all, if the executive did something that was too much, in Israel, for example, they used uh, the cell phone monitoring, which is usually only available for uh, people who are suspected of terrorism. They said, we're going to use this for uh, anyone who has COVID to trace their steps. And the law didn't allow that. And the court said, no, we know it's an emergency, but you can't do that. You have to go back to the legislature, change the law, if that's what you want to do. You can't just extend cell phone monitoring. Kosovo, similar kind of thing where the legislature didn't, uh, the president wanted to issue steps, had no authorization, and the court said, no, you have to go back and do that. When we do have a lockdown, of course, in a system of constitutional rights, it would be subject to proportionality. That is an evaluation of whether the steps were really necessary and the German court was very active in this. In one country, um, there was, in more than one country, but one example of a risk of something like this was in Malawi, a small African country. But in that country, the president had decided, the president had been uh, elected in very suspicious circumstances. He had cheated. And the court had ordered a new election before COVID. That order came down. Then COVID hit, and the president said, oh, my God, it's COVID. Well, we can't have this elect new election. And we can't, in fact, even have, um, in, and by the way, we're going to have a very strict lockdown. And the court then had to weigh public health versus political rights and democracy. And the court decided in favor of political rights and democracy. It said, yes, we know there's a public health emergency, but if you lock, have a lockdown, there will be no ability for the opposition to organize for this election. And not only that, you have to have the election. And they did hold the election, and the president lost and is out of power. So the court saved democracy from a risk that the president would abuse the COVID rules. There was a similar thing in Lesotho, where the president there had been accused of, uh, um, I think, ordering the murder of someone, and he was about to be impeached. And he said, well, we can't have the impeachment because parliament is suspended. It would be dangerous for all the parliamentarians to come into the same room. No, I just have to stick around. And the court said, no, you can't do that. You, the court said you cannot suspend parliament. And the parliament met and they kicked him out. Um, in some countries, early on in the pandemic, Zimbabwe, Kenya, actually more people died from the police enforcing the lockdown than from COVID for some months because the police are very violent and unrestrained. And so the courts said you can't, you know, they monitored that and said you couldn't do that. And then finally, in a couple of countries, they were led by presidents who were kind of COVID deniers. Brazil is the most famous. Uh, the current president of Brazil, Bolsonaro, you know, said, ah, it's no big deal. Let's all get it. He, you know, and what, and, and the courts, the lower courts in Brazil said, wait a minute, you can't. There's a right to health. You must have a lockdown. So notice that in my examples here, the courts are 
are some of them are saying you have to have a lockdown. Some of them are saying you can't have a lockdown. Some say you need these measures. Some say you need others. The COVID is a kind of thing where there's not one right response. It's about competing risk regulation. Do we, who is going to bear the risk? And that's usually seen as a very political decision. And there isn't a single right answer. There's obviously no single right answer that every country adopted. Every country comes to its own evaluation. The question is how? Is it just by the executive or is it by the executive balanced by courts and legislatures? And the answer is the latter. The balance was done in many countries by lots of different institutions in dialogue. Next slide. Um, the legislatures I mentioned before I guess I'll just mention one very good piece of legislation was passed in the United Kingdom. I think it was really a model because they, they uh, passed a single COVID bill that detailed all the exceptions that had to be done for all the other statutes, um, but very wisely said that as soon as the COVID is over, these provisions will expire. So they were limited temporarily. And it was a nice model of how to do it, a good legislative innovation, giving the executive the powers it needed, but not a blank check. Oversight um, in Bolivia, the um, president wanted to suspend the elections again, and the legislature said, no, you have to. So that kind of thing. Legislatures were involved too. Next slide. Now, how about my country? Well, uh, uh, I'm sorry. Maybe I should change the subject to some better... More pleasant topic. The United States did very bad in COVID. We lead the world in deaths. We're, we're fighting each other over masks, over everything. Um, I don't know that I would blame the Constitution, but the Constitution doesn't help. There's no emergency provision in the Constitution. There's only something about one particular thing, which uh, in habeas corpus. And that means that most of our laws are executive, are, excuse me, are, are statutes, there's a public health law, but in fact, the states are the ones who took the lead. In our system, in our federal system, the states have a lot of power. And some states wanted an aggressive response. Other states wanted a not aggressive response. Of course, in a country where everyone can travel, the least aggressive response is the response for everyone because people spread the disease. So states weren't an island. The governors had have under the statutes, under the state constitutions, a lot of power many, many powers, and they didn't use all of them. They were constrained. They didn't use what you, you know, you might think, well, if the executive was just able to do anything it wanted, you know, they didn't do it. They did it partly because of political constraints, but a little bit because of legal constraints too. There were a lot of court cases. Um, I just mentioned one here. The Supreme Court had a case, Catholic Church versus Cuomo. In New York, the governor said, we can't allow people to go to church in groups of more than 10 people. And the Catholic Church sued, and they won, because it turns out the governor was allowing groups of 50 people to go to sporting events. So that meant the religion was being treated worse than uh, other things, and the Supreme Court stepped in. Um, Cuomo, interestingly, was a hero for about five minutes uh, for his COVID response, but then <laughs> now he's disgraced and was impeached for sexual uh, uh, misconduct. Um, okay, so the one good thing about the United States had nothing to do with emergency provisions, really, a little bit, but it was the invention of the vaccine. And that was a public-private partnership. The private sector was very much in the lead. And in a way, um, I guess I want to use this also to say it wasn't the executive alone. Government helped. They committed to buying a lot of the doses, which meant the vaccine companies could do the research with, some, with less risk. But it certainly was not a situation where the government you know, alone could do anything. We had to rely on these other actors. Again, the executive is not unbound. Next slide. Okay. I want to now do a little more theory, theorizing here about the nature of different kinds of emergencies. The paradigm of emergency, and for each of these I ask a number of questions, the paradigm for an emergency is actually, you know, a national security crisis. And if you think about it, for a national security crisis, that means we have an immediate violent threat 
It's a fast crisis. It happens usually very quickly, at least at the beginning. We don't know how long it's going to last, but one of the key things about this kind of crisis is that information is concentrated in the center. We have one military, we have one commander in chief. They have to make decisions about how you deal with violence in a very centralized way. And therefore, it's also the case, of course, that you need a uniform response across a national territory. If we had five different armies not coordinated, we wouldn't be able to win a war. So you need coordination. So this is a kind of situation in which information is concentrated. You also need a lot of secrecy. You can't reveal the information or you'll lose the war. The other side will see it. And so it's a concentrated response. It's the kind of emergency for which we need centralized power. This is what we, you know, the constitutional clauses tend to emphasize this, that the executive has the information, the executive should respond. Now let's talk about a financial crisis. It's a different kind of crisis. Here it's not some violent enemy, but it's actually a failure of government often. Bad regulations lead to the financial crisis. And it also happens fast. It also might last a long time. It also is something where the information is concentrated. That is, again, you have many financial actors, but the regulation is done at the central level. And again, you need a uniform response across the country, though secrecy maybe is less of a less helpful because when the government is responding to financial crisis, the real job is to convince the private actors that they have it under control. So belief that the government is doing the right thing requires some transparency. But still, it's the kind of emergency in which you would want a centralized national response in the executive or in the central banks. But now let's think about new kinds of crises, natural disaster or a pandemic. Here, the enemy, if you will, is nature. And natural disaster is pretty simple. The tsunami happens. A pandemic is really complicated. It's as if you're playing a game. Imagine you're playing a war game against some enemy and you're trying to win the war in the video game. The thing about an, a pandemic is you're playing against an enemy which is smart. The pandemic is always changing in response to every move you make. And so it's very dynamic and very, maybe more difficult than a natural disaster. Natural disasters tend to, you know, some of them are fast, tsunamis, sometimes they're slow, climate change. Uh, but uh, pandemics usually are fairly slow moving and might last a really long time. And here's the key point. Information on how to fight the pandemic is highly decentralized. Because, and it's true of natural disasters too, like when the natural disaster hits, the local government knows exactly what territory was hurt, what the best response would be. And so maybe what we need to do for that is we need to empower the local government. For a pandemic, it's also a situation where the information is actually highly distributed. The healthcare system is treating people all over the country. It's not, the information has to be aggregated for the central government to make decisions, but the local level actually knows a lot. And so they have to play a role in the response. You, in natural disasters and pandemics, you don't need a central response for the entire territory, right? A tsunami affects some regions more than others. A pandemic also might have differential effects and certainly no need for secrecy. Therefore, I think these are situations where we have to think of government not the government response cannot be concentrated in a centralized executive. It has to work with other institutions. And this is, I think we might need to rewrite our constitutional provisions about emergency with this idea in mind that you need a framework where the local actors would be a little more empowered. Next slide. Okay. Um, one of the risks in emergencies is that Measures that are taken for temporary reasons become permanent. This is something we have in the United States in our national security law, where certain things like the emergency economic powers, which were passed to deal with like communism, are now used routinely to 
have tariffs and things like this. Trump used these a lot. Um, the recalibration of privacy once the cell phones you know, are tracking you. Now, of course, we all in Indonesia, I'm quite impressed. Everywhere I go, I can check in and I get to access. That's really great. I feel very safe. But of course, my privacy is now gone because someone could tell every, every motion I'm making if I'm in a public place. And we just re-change our expectations, I think. So that's a thing where we have a legacy here. Fake news laws, like there's a lot of reasons to combat disinformation, but then there's a lot of potential for abuse of those things. Um, immigration restrictions in the United States were adopted actually by Trump using COVID sometimes, and they've not been put back in place. And so there's a kind of legacy of these slow-moving disasters that probably also requires some thinking about the proper role of emergency power. Next slide. Okay, and I think maybe this will be the last slide I do. Of course, we also know that these things have been abused in some places. Um, Erdogan decided, in Turkey, decided to release prisoners during COVID because we don't want the con crowded conditions in the prison. The only people he kept in were people he charged after the 2016 coup, his political enemies. They got to stay in jail. So that's a kind of risk of these measures being applied in a discriminatory way. Um, obviously, the Hong Kong crackdown happened in an era when COVID was happening, and that meant it was harder for people to mobilize. Um, and um, I, get, you, I have Hun Sen there who decided to prosecute his political opponents using um, fake news. So the opposition party was accused of doing fake coronavirus news when they were just talking about Hun Sen. So there's always the potential of abuse. So that's always the two sides. Uh, next slide. Let's see. Okay, I think, I think keep going. One more. Yeah, let's just leave it at that. So the big picture. The executive is not unbound. The executive doesn't have the information to respond to these kind of modern emergencies. They have to share power with the legislature and the courts. And in fact, that's what we observe. Carl Schmitt was wrong, that there is no center person at the system and that law actually can constrain effectively. Now, but again, I want to emphasize when I say the law can constrain, it has to be a pragmatic idea about law, not just a strict formalist view. Still, we have so much evidence that the law constitutions did work during the pandemic. The last thing I'll say is that some countries declared a constitutional emergency, some did not. And that would depend on their local conditions and, you know, and it turns out that didn't matter very much. Even if they didn't declare a national emergency, they still had measures, some were legal, some were not. We don't also have any measure that one legal response led to better health outcomes. That obviously depends on lots of other things. Indonesia, you've had a very good response, as Professor Jim Lee said. Uh, we don't know why that is, but it might not be because of the law, per se. That's just a lot of other factors. Okay. Um, I'll conclude by just leaving you with this side, slide. If you want to, that slide. If you want to look at more at what these constitutions say, this is a website I run called the Constitute Project, and it has every constitution uh, in the world, and what they say, you can just type in emergency, and you can read all the different clauses. Are they detailed? Are they not? You know, who knows if there will be reform in Indonesia, but it's always a good idea in thinking about changing constitutions to look at what other countries have done and think about what might be appropriate in this particular context. And with that, I thank you very much. Appreciate it. To Professor Ginsburg. Okay, thank you for your thank you, Professor, for your insightful and wonderful presentation. And I, I quite impressed with the methodology. Yeah, you you provide us with the general overview on how wars constitutional are in the situation or emergency. But instead, what we find is light of optimism that law can indeed uh, create a good response and bound the authoritarian uh, approach to, to re in, in responding to the pandemic. I think it's a good a highlight of, uh, in, in your uh, presentation. Again, without further ado, I, uh, I, firstly, I would like to remind you that the Q&A is uh, going to be uh, done after
last speaker but you can ask your question in Q&A in Zoom and untuk Bapak Ibu yang punya per, uh, memiliki pertanyaan tetapi ingin menyampaikan dalam bahasa Indonesia saya akan mencoba mentranslasikannya jadi jangan khawatir and uh, also this uh, presentation uh, this panel also is stream in uh, YouTube in our faculties Uh, channel uh, it's called uh, Fakultas Hukum UI you can uh, subscribe in the YouTube and watch it uh, later or, or now and for in Zoom for uh, your information professor we have uh, 70 uh, guests who that uh, just listed you to your uh, presentation uh, without further uh, okay without further ado we are uh, we are inviting uh, the third speaker Dr. Kurota Ayuni she just uh, finished her doctoral studies on very same topic the uh, hukum tata negara darurat di Indonesia or emergencies constitutional law in Indonesia so Dr. Kurota Ayuni uh, floor is yours Assalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. Thank you very much. Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. My name is Ayu, and thank you very much for idea for FAUI. To, uh, let me speak here to present my idea about how state of emergency in Indonesia, in my perspective, in my research for four years. And then the most thing make me happier is I, I'm speaking after Tom Ginsburg and <laughs> Prof. Jim Riyasidiki, which those prominent scholar, I cited both in my uh, uh, dissertation. So this is very, very honor for me. And then thank you very much for your uh, attendance to this uh, forum. Uh, the first of all, yeah, we all know COVID-19. And since we all know COVID-19, we start to learn about state of emergency, right? Before there is no COVID-19, people are thinking, what, what, what is state of emergency? We just know normal constitutional law there is no state in emergency we all know just state of emergency in case of war in in case of conflict an army conflict but after covid 19 the literature about the state of emergency now being brought into a, a lot of different way like prof skinsberg said it's not about the war this is not about the violence This is also about the crisis of economic, crisis of pandemic, and many crises that we're facing today, like natural disaster. Next. Uh, along this uh, process, I also write in a lot of journal, some of the journal, and then this is what I find in my journal, and this is my uh, uh, co-promotor, Pavitra Arsil, Dr. Pavitra Arsil, who helped me a lot in researching this all of thing, and many of idea We are sharing together and then discussing many of things about constitutional uh, issues in Indonesia. The next, the thing that we find that in our uh, research, the first thing is the theory of Carl Smith would say all law is situational law. I think I don't have to re repeat again what Professor Tom Gisbert already mentioned about what Carl Smith mean by normal law cannot be applied in the emergency situation and then Emergency law cannot apply in the normal situation, so it should be put in place. If there is a normal law, should be applied in normal situation, and then it is, if there is an emergency law, it should be applied in the emergency situation. Because why? Because if we put normal law in norm, if we put emergency law in normal situation, they cannot be applied. They cannot be working, because there is a different situation, and may, and maybe administration fall down. Like in COVID-19, we cannot go to put our rights in the administrative products because the office is closed and such and such like that. So there is still a different kind of uh, government. There is uh, what they call as a regular government, and there is also an exceptional government. Then uh, Carl Smith also explained about the exception and the sovereign, and that's also already explained by Professor Tom Gisberg, so I don't have to repeat it again. Next. But what I uh, learned in our constitution, in Undang-Undang Dasar 1945, and which has uh, not been changed at all since it was born in 1945, it's Article 12 that mentioned, that Prof. Jim also mentioned in the first, if the president declared a state of emergency, the condition for such a declaration and the subsequent measuring regarding a state of emergency shall, shall be regulated by 
law. It should be not state of emergency, state of danger, the text keadaan bahaya, not state of emergency. But the concept for me is similar, like state of emergency. Keadaan bahaya is type of danger. Yes, terminology in the world has a different names for state of emergency. There is state of danger, state of alarm, state of exception, and so on. But in Indonesia, we call it state of danger. So in Article 12, this is my finding that I think this is kind of what important thing in my uh, research. Article 12 of 1945 Constitution basically have some kind of distributive emergency. So there is not only an executive that holds the power to control the emergency. The president only has the power to declare, but the condition, terms, conditions, subsequent, and the effect of the state of emergency shall be regulated by the law. The law itself is a product by the legislative. So if I thinking again about Article 12, and then I try to compare it with another constitution that has been uh, happened to Indonesia, like Constitusi RIS, like UDS, uh, it's all same. The president can declare, but it should be followed. It should be according to the law. So the law is like an ex ante of the condition of the term and condition of the of the emergency. So I think like Article 12 consists two uh, branch of the power. The first is the executive, and the second one is the legislative. And that and that next and according to uh, yeah a little bit messy there. But actually, not that messy. Okay. Uh, but actually, there's a lot of type and models of the typology that I also quote Prof. Ginsburg and uh, Fersak. And then it's there is a Roman dictatorship, neo Roman dictatorship, legislative model, and a lot of things, a lot of models. But I think like Article 12 is similar or more closely to the model that maybe we can call as legislative model. So legislative models mean uh, having the legislation to control, to make a limit, to un to make bound boundaries for the executive. What Prof. Gisberg worried about the unbound executive, like in Posner books, Sun mentioned Posner Posner books, is maybe can be limited because of this type of models, which is legislative models. I find that Article 12 in a concept is more close to the legislative model. Next. Yeah, this is uh, already mentioned also by Professor Ginsburg. So uh, yeah, in, in crisis, in crisis uh, the executive governs nearly alone, so they're most of the time Unbound. And then so there is a model to cope with those problems and it calls legislative model, which is an approach in which the legislator is capable of creating law used to regulate matters undertaken by an emergency rule in a state of emergency. Next. However, in Indonesia, we have problem. Many of the law that created by the parliament didn't use the Article 12 in consideration. What what is what is mean by that? It means that those law, according Prof. Jimri, is not under the state of emergency because they are not using the Article 12 in their consideration. So this is like an old normal rule. However, if we, if I read one each one article in those law, and then I find that. There is an exception, there is a discretion, there is an emergency, there is a different type of approach of government, and then the, the, and it also be called by the emergency regime, so or emergency uh, government. So I think, in my research also saying, that this law that creates a different approach of the emergency in emergency situation should follow and then um, including Article 12 in their consideration, because yeah, we we are 
approaching the constitutionalism should be under constitution. Next, after we're talking about the uh, concept and then the law in Indonesia, I try to explain my research also with Bapak Dr. Fitzgerald Arsil that have been published in the Journal of Legislative Studies called The Disappearance, Disappearance of the Legislative Model Indonesian Parliament Experience in COVID-19. So this is a research how to see, okay, if we believe that Article 12 is a legislative model, and then what legislative do, what legislative done in the COVID-19 pandemics? So we research what legislative do in those in this time, in this era, and in, in the COVID-19 pandemic uh, period of time. So because we're standing, our standing is Article 12 is a legislative model, even though the concept is maybe legislative model, but the application is maybe way more different than legislative model, and that's why I research about this. Uh, there's a lot of the part, the loss of situation that might not be ideal in the legislative model in the COVID-19 situation in, in Indonesian political spectrum today. The first is we have high presidential legislation power legislative power, coalition supported by a majority of the parliament, check and balances in emergency, which is very low by the parliament, even though we are a legislative model. The lawmaking process in the parliament is very un abnormal, but in, in a very different way, not in abnormal situation. So we have to quick and have fast track for uh, cope the COVID-19 issue. But this is way different than that. Uh, next. Next, okay, our finding is, first, the COVID-19 pandemics has rendered the executive branch more powerful and control many legislative agenda. This is maybe kind of a bit different than maybe another country happens in the world. Because in our study in Indonesia, the president become the leader of the executive agenda. Many of the law that has been passed in the parliament is initiated by the president, even though we also believe that the, uh, the legislative power is in the legislative branch, which is parliament. But the fact in our legislation today, in the fast track regulation, and I will explain about how the law creation job, Undang Undang Cipta Kerja, is only passed in a very short time, and then Undang Undang Minerba, meaning and law, and we call. Uh, management is only a very short time and a lot of law that actually not relate to COVID-19 has been passed in very, very, very short period of time. And most of those law are proposed by the president. So the executive has those control in, in, the, in the legislative power. Second, the lawmaker tend to discuss legislative product by simplifying the procedure and then according to the prof. Uh, Tom Ginsburg, it has happened many in uh, in the in the in, in the in the world that they use video conference, they use um, yeah, online meeting, and then a lot online uh, application that they can of uh, it can be a uh, procedure of the parliament can be done in the COVID nineteen situation, so they can keep uh, the the protocol and such. Third, the legislative productivity increased. So this is what happened in Indonesia, the productivity to create the law in the COVID-19 pandemic increase. Sometimes in the COVID-19 situation, everyone slowed down their works, but not in the parliament of Indonesia. They increased their work. And then surprisingly, there is a lot of uh, increase of movement of the society. Even though there is a protocol, PPKM, uh, uh, quarantine and such, people still have rally in the in the in, in the Jakarta, or in the head of order of Jakarta to protest many of the law that may be controversial in the public. The fourth, the public openly protest and rail. They suspect that state of emergency should uh, would be exploited by the political elite to pass while accommodating their agendas, affording little benefit, or maybe in the, in the unconstitutional court meaningful, less meaningful participation to the public. Next. So this is what I want, uh, this is what I explain in our papers uh, about the roles, parliament in, 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 the, in the 
in the uh, COVID-19 situation, the budgeting function that also reduced by the purple COVID-19, the uh, government regulation in lieu of law, and then the legislative function, there is an oversight or there is no oversight, and then there's a very minimum oversight uh, during the COVID-19 to the executive because the executive is most of the time controlling the agenda. Next. Uh, I think this is also already mentioned by Professor Jim Lea Siddiqui, but I want to explain that by declaring using this uh, law, actually the president already declared the state of emergency, in my opinion. However, we have a different point of view that this is not according Article 12. If they put the card Article 12 as a consideration, then it's a state of emergency legally by the Constitution. The question would be, why did you just not put Article 12? Why, why just, how, how difficult is that to put Article 12 as a consideration of the making of the law that have a characteristic of state of emergency? The problem in Indonesia, what I find is, many people afraid of Article 12 because of historical issues, not the conceptual issues. We are facing that the Article 12 used in the consideration of the Undang Undang um, State of Danger, State of Danger Law, which creates Operation Military Military Era in Timor Timor, in Papua, in Aceh, and there is a lot of violence in those area during that state of emergency using Article 12. So I believe that many people, or maybe legislation, a government, or maybe many scholar, doesn't really know about what the use of the Article 12, because they always think that Article 12 is only limited to the uh, military issues, to the uh, war issue, or maybe to the like violence issue, but not in the pandemic, crisis, economy, like um, uh, blah, blah, uh, law, natural disaster, and such like that. So I believe that people resist to use Article 12 only because of the historical the uh, maybe misunderstanding about article 12. The second, the president also activate the non-natural disaster according to the law on disaster management. So this is what I believe that very in line with the legislative model, which uh, the legislation creates the boundaries using the law, and then the president activate by declaring the law under the undang-undang under the law undang-undang law on disaster management or law on health quarantine act and something like that and then after that the president cannot make any discretion any exception if it is not stated in those law i mean yeah there is a lot of discretion inside that inside that law but the, the president cannot use those declaration of covid 19 pandemic to add more period of time to get rule in Indonesia and such and such because there is not mentioned in the law. So there's a limited to make restriction into the uh, state of emergency in the, in the presidential system according to the what I learned in Article 12 in the law and the law in Indonesia. And the third, uh, the president of Indonesia made a government regulation in lieu of law or we call it PERPU. For Indonesian speaker, for Indonesian listener and audience, I know there is a lot of debates on Article 22 that I have standing myself. Maybe this is not part of the state of emergency. I believe if there is no law applicable, then the president can make the government regulation in lieu of law to fulfill the miss of the law that ready in, in that period of time. After that, the parliament can agree or disagree with that in uh, the government regulation in the of our record purple. Next. Okay, next. Next. Okay. Yeah, the idea of the legislative model is to make the president uh, get control by the legislative. So the, the, they both sharing the responsibility instead of emergency. Next. But however, what happens in Indonesia today is the government or the executive is the controller of the agenda 
it's because of the political parties in Indonesia are majority supporters of the president. More than actually 81.91% of the member of the parliament in Indonesia uh, are the supporter of the executive. And then only slow, less number is the opposition. So there's simply less check and balances because many of them are supporting president a lot. And then the anomaly of making law in times of emergency in COVID-19 pandemic in Indonesia. Next. As we can see that they pass a lot of law in very limited of time while it is a very heavy law. It's not a simple law. Like job creation law is a law that change more than 70 law. Law on Ibu Kota Negara, it's capital city. They want to change the capital city from Jakarta and to another place, which is a huge effort. And then they pass it in a very short time in the last of December, when, when people might not very take their eyes into the legislation. And then the pass law on the mineral and coal, meaning mineral law, and also very take a lot of pro and cons in the, in the society. So, uh, next, the greater legislative productivity in times of pandemic. Yeah, in, uh, in 2020, there is a lot of controversial law passed in the parliament with less meaningful participation. And that's why I believe that legislative model in higher legislative power in Indonesia doesn't seem work. So it should be another branch of power to take this check and balances job. So next, uh, I made a research also with Dr. Fitra Arsil, and this is the performance of the first year of general election prolegnas. So they are high, higher. They are very productive. Then sometimes we are questioning. Many of law in Indonesia takes three years, four years, five years, another next period to pass and very difficult. And then why this is very easy to them to take pass the law in very, very short time while the law is not related to the COVID, not really related to the COVID. Next, like there's also a slide on legislative performance based on the number of the page of the law. Why we use page of the law? Because there is a new way of the omnibus law. So they just pass one law, changing 70 more law. But if we took Closely, it changed 70 law, actually. But yeah, so we, we take the pages. This is the performance according to the law. And then uh, next also, the quick discussion process and approval. It took only very few months, August to September, April to October, February to May, procedure simplification. Yeah, even though the, 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 the procedure gets simplified, but the participation is very low. If we want to hear people voice, the citizen voice, using the Zoom or video conference, it's easier actually, but they don't use it. But if they pass the law, they use it. So this is a kind of different thing. And then it's like a, a political will, like Prof. Jimmy said. Next, yeah, this is process simplification. And next, this is the attendance of uh, the DPR RI. DPR RI means House of Representative in the plenary session. And then we can see that, yeah, there's a high presentation, but only them, but not participation of the public uh, to being heard in the, uh, in, in the process of the uh, uh, participation uh, to us assessing the law, uh, the, the bill. Next, the president has the control of the legislative agenda. Then, and I believe there is a little bit absent of legislative model practice. Uh, yeah, why? Because their productivity was high, discussion very limited and too quickly, procedure was simplified, the content material were not directly and closely related to the pandemic, nor the emergency that the country was facing like in Indonesia. So there's a lot of issue that they are work about, but not, mostly, mostly not related to COVID-19, but many of them are uh, talking about uh, many of them are content uh, economic and, and, and other things. 
that maybe if they are pass it in the normal situation, it will not as easy as that because many of protests from the public. Public reaction, what happened next? What happened when the parliament next? What happened when the parliament used those kind of moves? The first is the people get rally and then, yeah, it's obvious, it's dangerous because we, ha we are in the health, health situation, health emergency. So if people gather and such and such, they will en en endanger themselves. And then the second one, this is what I really want to discuss more and research more if I have an opportunity to research about this, is the, the situation that all law that been passed in the pandemic straight away go to the Mahkamah Constitutional Court. So people try to transfer the public discussion. It should be in the parliament to the Constitutional Court. They want to be heard by the court, by the state, by, uh, by the country. Why? Because the parliament cannot hear them. So they transfer it to the pengujian formal, to the formal uh, judicial review. And that's why I believe this is very interesting to find out and give hopes for the judicial branch in, in a state of emergency. Even though in our constitution, the constitutional court has very nothing specifically explain about the state of emergency. Uh, I have, next, yeah, I have a huge optimism to judicial power. Even though maybe legislative power is not very working well in Indonesia, even though the Article 12 is relatively close to the art, uh, to judicial uh, legislative, legislative model, but Optimism to digital power, I can find in the Constitutional Court decision number 37, 2020 court concerning the COVID law 19. It gives, the that decision gives the limits of the COVID-19 emergency only for maybe two years and should be re reviewed again. And that's why, in my opinion, in our constitution where the presidential legislative power is high, according Article 6 and Article 22 and Article 23, 24, our constitution, the president has a lot of power. Budgeting, the, the proposing bill is the president, Perpu, uh, uh, in lieu of law, is president, and then many of the power legislative is in the, in the president. When the situation of our constitution state that, and then the situation where the parliament has majority supporters, then I believe, in my research stated, the legislative model that should be bounding the executive get low impact to that state of emergency concept. I think that's all for me. If you want to read a lot of our research on COVID-19, then maybe we can check next again a paper related to COVID-19. And then thank you very much for this opportunity. I would like to hear and have very, very happy if we have this further discussion. So by you, the time is yours. Okay, thank you very much. Please give a applause, huge applause to Dr. Trotayoni. Very interesting indeed. Uh, well, the papers are somehow connected. It, it, it elaborates more on uh, Professor Tom research, and she again she get, uh, underlined the hope, hopes and optimism for judicial power to control the action of legislative and uh, the executive. Okay, we are now entering uh, the Q and A session. We have around forty minute ish to uh, before we conclude, and in Zoom we have sixty. For participants, then uh, we uh, I, I'm now opening. Uh, uh, I, I I must note that uh, Professor Jim Lee is unable to join us until the end of session. Uh, he already left, uh, so probably a question related to Indonesian uh, law uh, could be asked to to Dr. Kurotayuni. And I will now invite three questions first both from uh, zoom and uh, offline participants 
for uh, those of you are in uh, Zoom room, you could uh, raise your hand and I will uh, open the mic. And for in person, Bapak, yeah. And please raise your hand. Now, offline, we have two uh, participants asking. Go for it. Digital. Bapak yang sebelah kanan satu dulu, dulu Bang Pram. Bapak yang ini ya dulu. Uh, please Pak uh, state your name and institutions and uh, uh, question and for whom the question is asked. Test test. Ya. Yeah. Oke, okay, thank you. Uh, uh, good morning everyone. My name is Wajar, alumni of Universitas Indonesia. Uh, I am also uh, the attendee of yesterday event at the Constitution, Constitutional Court. Uh, yesterday, Prof. Tom uh, mentioned about populism, and today uh, uh, you discuss about state of emergency. I want to ask you that, uh, can we conclude that uh, the populism is the main factor of state of emergency violation? Thank you. Okay, thank you uh, for the second question, B uh, Bang Pram. Thank you. Uh, my name is Pramudia, uh, alumni from UI and also Chicago. My question, I think, uh, is more to uh, Bakurata, eh, Bayu. Uh, I want to understand more on on the idea that you're saying that, uh, that there is less legislative control. But what I, what I understand is that if 80% actually supporting the president, and they re and we assume that they are being elected from a, a, a fair and a fair election, then do, don't they actually re represent? The, the, the majority of the population. So why you can claim that actually there is less control from the legislative uh, against the president, and why you claim also that uh, the fact that some people actually bring the law uh, to the constitutional court means that this is a check and balance, or that it actually implies that people have trouble with that law. Because again, uh, I think we understand in Indonesia there are a lot of frivolous claim. Some claims just doesn't make any sense, and people are always free to, to bring the claims to the court, right? So I just want to understand uh, what's the basis of the theory saying that, oh, This indicates that the law is bad or something like that. Thank you. We have one more question for this time being. Okay, three. Bapak yang. So far, none from Zoom, but you can still ask through chat. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you. My name is Ferry Amsari. Uh, uh, what I'm gonna say is, I will not. Uh, giving you three questions like Dr. Ayu did yesterday because my question is about what is the negative impact during declaration of emergency state or law by whoever like president during pandemic such as uh, the involvement of military or a political agenda like Jokowi did last time in local uh, election in 2020 for giving a chance to his sons and his son-in-law again uh, uh, to winning the, the, the election. Or probably we can discuss about uh, the potential corruption during the pandemic when uh, declaration of uh, emergency coming uh, from the president. So, I mean, why we don't try to elaborate, elaborate more about the, the negative side of emergency law? Thank you. Okay, for time being, uh, let's conclude the first Q&A session. Uh, so, I think, Professor Tom, are you ready with the, your answer? Yeah. Testing? Yeah. Please. There we go. Uh, great, great question. So, um, uh, Mr. Anjar, you know, is populism the main factor in declaring states of emergency? It turns out, no. In fact, one of the interesting observations scholars made is usually we think of the risk of executive overreach, executives abusing power, But so many of the populace actually did what we'd say is underreach. They didn't use power at all. They just let the people die rather than a, you know, use power and exploited maybe the information or the disinformation environment. Bolsonaro in Brazil, for sure. Donald Trump, you know, 
This wasn't a di classic dictator at all. And it's a weird phenomenon. You, it just, it, it's a puzzle a little bit as to why that's happening. I still don't really fully understand it, but it's definitely happening. Um, and yeah, I mean, maybe it has to do with, well, I don't know. It's a, it's a, it's a puzzle as to why that's going on. So it's the, um, populists aren't more likely to declare states of emergency, maybe less likely. Um, Ferry raises the risk of the negative, the question of negative risk. Absolutely. There's all kinds of negative risk. That's not really what our study was doing. We were mostly concerned with the question of is the executive unbound? But as you raise, there's certainly the political risk of staying in office. I did give some examples of Hun Sen and these others who abused the state of emergency. And so you then might say, well, which countries where, you know, where the results more moving in the direction of authoritarianism and which countries in the directions of democracy. And it turns out it sort of was parallel with what we knew anyway. We already know the things which are more likely to lead to democratic backsliding or democratic, um, you know, the end of democracy. And it's things like a legacy of military rule, poverty, um, you know, um, legacy of, 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 of coups and things like this. And it turns out that was true in COVID just like in other situations. So there, there was nothing new about the countries that abused power. No one is surprised that Hun Sen abused power. He's been doing that for 40 years. Um, but um, there are countries where it might have made a difference for the health of the democracy. Maybe the United States is one. And I would like to kind of, I think it might be too soon to tell. You know, we're still in COVID. The immediate response is over, but there's still, and thus the abuses that would be apparent. But this is what I was sort of suggesting. The long-term impacts on law and society are still mysterious because we know people are, you know, really angry, very upset. That leads to helping more populist leaders. Um, we know that there's distrust of government and public health service. In our country, the Center for Disease Control just came out and said, you know, we, we did a bad job. And that's good that they were honest about it. And the professionals who were watching them said, yeah, they're doing a bad job. But that might have a long-term detrimental effect on the health of democracy if everyone starts distrusting the government even more. So I think it's a, some of the risks are short-term. Like you mentioned, corruption, that'd be a great study. You know, who in the usual question is follow the money. <laughs> who got the contracts to implement the public health emergencies? And I think we'd learn a lot in many countries from that, maybe Indonesia, um, and um, as well as the more long-term health of democracy is an ongoing question. So it's a long way of not really answering your question, but you get the idea. Thank you, Professor Tom. Um, Dr. Ayuni, would you follow up? Your the question? Uh, I think I will ask answer the one question from pra Pramudia yeah, because this is directly to me. The first thing is why I believe that the yeah the parliament, like we understand about check and balances systems, separation of power, and such and such like that, it should be even though they are why we are a presidential system because we want to have a separation and but have a check and balances. Check and balances means in theoretically not let another branch of power control everything and should be uh, and should be restrained by another one. So what we have is like our constitution also stipulated many of check and balances. However, in our study, in our constitutional law, in our faculty, many of research of our uh, uh, many of research and papers shows that uh, the construction of our constitution, 1945 constitution have bring a lot of power, high legislative presidential power to the president. Because, uh, and that's why we have to very carefully in terms of the, the situation between the legislative and the executive. Your question is why I disagree if there are a lot of coalition, 81%. I don't think the number should be problems if they do the jobs, the check and balances job. But what I see that maybe in political perspective, even though I have no background on political, 
but this what happened in Indonesia politics seems like a bargaining of power like do you want some kind of power in that some situation in some situation in, in in institution and there's not an institutionalizing the concept the concept of check and balances it's just a bargaining the power and that's what happened in 81 percent because in the first election, we have two, two candidates, right? The Prabowo ones and the Jokowi ones. And after, after that, they are migrating to the Jokowi sides and left the opposition, a very small number. And this is not help, actually. The opposition should be half belief on themselves to maintain the check and balances which stipulated in our constitution. And it's a good one, like Yakult. There's a bacteria that's good for our body, and that's fine. And that's why I believe in my research, 81%, they are very supporter, hard, hard supporting, because I can see how undang-undang passed only in two weeks, in one month, in recession. They passed that, that kind of law, which usually and normally never can be done in normal situation. They are very strong effort to pass some kind of law, which is if we follow it in the YouTube, very less of discussion because they already discuss under the table. That's the problem. The second one, there's a pro and cons in public and that's okay. I don't like that law, you don't like that law. You can bring it to the constitutional court, that's okay. But the problem in my research is not, sometimes people bring the law because they have the constitutional uh, uh, problems. But in the case of the law that being passed in the pandemic, they don't have to wait constitutional laws. Constitutional laws usually consist of material review. If there's a clause, a material, an article that I have the rights and then it, it, less, it creates a balance, it, it creates, uh, uh, it creates uh, something that avoiding my rights and such and such, and they come to the constitutional court. But what happened in the law that passed in the pandemic, it's not about material review. It's a formal review. Now, that's why I believe this is transferring the discussion, the participation. People doesn't get a lot of time, a lot of discussion process in the parliament. So they want to transfer this communication public, discussion public, public discussion, into the court. And that's why I believe, even though this research, I just started, but not finished it yet, because I just finished the issue about the state of emergency. Maybe later on, I will discuss about judicial review. And that's why I believe that if the judicial review is on about the formal review, and I believe maybe something wrong with those issues. And one of the constitutional court decision also mentioned about that the meaningful participation on undang-undang job creation, the job creation law. And that's why I believe that, okay, in those, uh, in those phenomena, in those phenomena, that phenomena, I believe there is something linking and missing also. And that's why I believe, yeah, the transfer is happening in the parliament to the, to the court, and it's kind of check and balances. And I have optimistic in constitutional court Inshallah. <laughs> Thank you very much. Thank you for your uh, answer. And now I think we still have time for another session. Oh, uh, Professor, sorry. Oh, you, your second question. Yeah. Please. Well, I, I don't know if I, there's another question for me, but I would, did want to ask uh, Dr. Ayu a question. Oh, yeah, sure. So, okay. you know, so you, I guess I want to know a little more detail about how these laws are actually drafted. You, you make the case persuasively that they're not putting enough effort into it, sending it to the court, that court becomes a place of public participation. But is it done in the parliament at all? Does the government just come up with it and then hand it to them? Um, and who in the government is doing the relevant laws? Are they well trained? I, you know, you could imagine that even if the government is drafting laws, they still would be better. So what's, it, what's the actual mechanics of drafting legislation in Indonesia? Please. Phone a friend. Yeah, but <laughs> there is no option of phone a friend. You know? <laughs> Raise hand or something like that. So I'm just kidding. So the, as far as I know, the procedure of the uh, 
having and passing the law in the parliament is that we have a list in a year that this is one we want to pass some kind of law one two three and ten or maybe twenty, and then in the first session of the uh, uh, parliament they will agree with those kind of prolegnas uh, program legislat prioritas priority legislation, and after that those uh, those bills can be come from the, the parliament and also come from the president. But what I meant by high legislative power is this is like this. The article 60A, if I'm not mentioned, the president have sh should be jointly discuss and agree with the law, not only giving to the parliament and then that's it. They have to discuss it together. But in the United States, the president has the veto. And if the veto rejected by the uh, parliament, they also continue with that law. But in Indonesia, once the parliament, once the president suppress something, yeah, if the president didn't put the presidential letter to agree to discuss one law or one bill, so there is will be no discussion at all in the parliament. And that's why I see in our constitution, the design, this is the OE perspective, yeah. I'm saying maybe another faculty, another university have a different point of view, but in our in University of Indonesia, in our constitutional law, we believe that our constitution design a high power legislative to the executive. That's that's what I what 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 I believe in my office now. Yeah, that's. And the second of all, not only legislative term, but also the budget. The interesting about budget is the proposing one is only and only, only. The executive, never, never, never legislative. Because the one who knows about the numbers and etc. Et et is only the executive. While when they come and bring those those uh, budget, budget uh, bills, it's becoming the law to the legislative. The legislative only will accept it, or maybe will, they will have a checklist on those, like give a mark of something, something, something. And sometimes it's like of negotiating proportion of money on powers. I know, you know. Yeah, that, that's 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 that, that's that's happen in Indonesia. Yeah, so not only legislative, but also budget, but also perpu. Perpu is the government regulation in lieu of law. In COVID, we also have those kind of perpu, COVID nineteen perpu, which very interestingly in Article twenty seven, if I'm not mistaken, give the authority to per, to executive to change the APBN, the national budget, without permission of the parliament. Even though, according to the Article 23 of our Constitution, if you want to revise the budget or make a budget, you need to have a permission by the Parliament. Even though that's purple, that uh, government regulation in view of law against the Constitution, but the fact is the purple, the government regulation in lieu of law, easily passed in the Parliament, even though it's violated their rights. It's very interesting. Yeah. 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 If I'm if I'm not mistaken, that's what what I believe in our constitution. Thank you. I think Professor I think you have another response <laughs> judging by your face. Please. You have <laughs> I was just, I'm just going to tell you what I was thinking. I was really puzzled about this 80% majority in the legislature. You know, that doesn't happen much in democracies. The basic principle of democracy is you want to get what we call the minimum winning coalition. You know, if you have, if there's 100% of the seats, you want to have exactly 51% for your coalition because then you could divide up 100% of the budget among the 51%. Um, so it's really rare to see this kind of, you know, grand coalition, especially when there was no crisis. Sometimes you see grand coalitions during an emergency or during a war or something, then everyone comes together. 
But this is kind of normal politics, normal time, and you have this 80% coalition. So I was just thinking to myself, what is going on? And, you know, how can I find out? So, that, you know, and I don't obviously have an answer. So please have research with us. Yes, I think I have to do that. There has to be someone who, know, you know, can tell me the inside deal that has uh, produced this kind of uh, situation. Yeah, interesting. Now, so we still have time for, uh, I think, around two or three questions. Yeah, uh, please. Okay. To make halal what I have eat, I want to ask Mr. Tom, but in Indonesia, Bahasa. I don't want uh, you will uh, this information with my question. Uh, saya mau tanya gini. Dengan cerita Ayu tadi, Pak Tom, masih aman nggak Indonesia itu sebagai sebuah negara demokrasi konstitusional? Kenapa? Karena begitu banyak produk yang tidak terkait dengan pandemi yang akan berlaku setelah pandemi yang kemudian diselundupkan pada saat pandemi kemarin melalui proses fast legislation yang tadi diceritakan. Jadi uh, kalau berbahaya bagi penanganan pandemi seperti yang terjadi di Brazil, di Amerika seperti juga Tom bilang tadi, itu kan bicara bagaimana negara merespon kondisi pandemik mengeluarkan undang-undang darurat untuk mengatasi pandemi. Tapi Indonesia itu jauh lebih melompati itu. Kondisi pandemik dimanfaatkan untuk nanti digunakan pasca pandemi. Our government make law to use after pandemic era. And maybe uh, after this year, and maybe 20 and 23 until 2024, maybe until next and next and next. Jadi saya mau tanya uh, dan kondisi ini masih aman nggak kita sih sebagai sebuah negara konstitusional gitu loh? Karena ancamannya luar biasa bagi saya. Itu yang pertama. Lalu yang kedua, uh, meaningful participation. Apa mungkin kemudian uh, kondisi pandemi itu kita bisa mewujudkan meaningful participation itu? Karena semua dibatasi. Semua dibatasi. Itu aja, makasih. Oke, okay, thank you Pak. Uh, before I jump to Zoom questions, I like to tra- uh, would like to translate the prior questions be- uh, oleh Pak siapa? Maaf. Jadi Pak, uh, yeah. Pak Joni Iskandar. Uh, so first question uh, he asked about, uh, well, c- can you call uh, still categorize Indonesia as a constitutional democracy, and is it safe to say that Indonesia is constitutional democracy? Because as he ma- uh, he mentioned two, two things. First, there are many laws that non-pandemic related but still pass in uh, within the parliament, and in fact, the the, the law that is has been passed is. Uh, still have effect even beyond the pandemic. Well, how how how, how uh, would you comment on that? Second question is the uh, how to realize uh, meaningful participation in times of pan- uh, emergency or uh, in pandemic because there are so many restrictions put in place, and how to realize and uh, how to achieve the meaningful participation. That is the uh, second uh, question, and uh, for. Uh, Question from Zoom. I will invite, uh, I think, uh, Pak Reza from BPHN first, and uh, then Pak Sonia. Uh, Pak Reza, please, un- uh, you could unmute your uh, Zoom. Okay. Uh, thank you very much, uh, moderator, for the opportunity. Uh, good morning, uh, Professor Tom. Uh, I would like to uh, ask regarding to, do you have any Uh, inspiring idea to uh, the best way how to limit uh, how to uh, how to limit or how to restrict the substance of the emergency law, uh, especially regarding to a criminal patient. Uh, we know that uh, historically Indonesia had a perpu terrorism which uh, contain a death penalty. And we can uh, uh, the deviation of the non-retroactive uh, principle. While when we talk about the criminal provision, 
we have a uh, uh, one uh, main principle that means uh, principle of legality which uh, historically uh, the struggling to uh, against the subjective uh, subjectivity of the king subjectivity of the executive uh, power so uh, i need your opinion uh, whether the substance of the criminal provision in the emergency law is it uh, constitutional or unconstitutional because uh, we have also the several constitutional court decision uh, when we talk about uh, let's say uh 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 purple uh, terrorism and also we have a uh, purple castration uh some of uh, a kind of uh, complicated punishment in our criminal legal system uh, i need your, your 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 opinion regarding to uh, criminal provision and the emergency law uh, related also to a principle of legality thank you very much for the opportunity <laughs> thank you pak terima kasih bapak reza Ke- uh, next i invite ibu sotma uh, dari ibu sonia siwu dari from Universitas uh, Surabaya. Okay, thank you uh, Mr. Rizky as a moderator of this forum. Um, yeah, I am Sonia from University of Surabaya, East Java. And these questions is for Professor Tom and Dr. Kurata. Yeah, um, we are now discussing Uh, of state of emergency in a contemporary world. So uh, I just found uh, one keyword, one keyword uh, from Professor Tom about uh, proportionality principle. Yeah. So uh, my my question is, how should we interpret it proportionality in the emergency law in time of COVID nineteen pandemic? This keyword is uh, discussed in my dissertation titled of uh, titled the state of emergency in Indonesia. So I'm still wondering uh, how should we interpret it in uh, related to check and balances uh, the principle one principle in a state of emergency and that is uh, proportionality because uh, in time of pandemic COVID-19, uh, uh, I see that a controversial discussion uh, uh, that people still confusing how to uh, make a priority or government, how to make a priority in uh, their policies between the right to health or the right to expression. So uh, I think while we are talking about the proportionality then we should focus what is the priority of the policy to uh, to make a balance yeah a balance in uh, in uh, fulfillment of our rights our uh, people rights yeah uh, so for me uh, it should be not discussed uh, or wondering about uh, the the measurement of uh, the emergency of uh, COVID-19 pandemic because for me, it's an emergency situation. COVID-19 pandemic is emergency situation. Uh, so the question is, uh, how should government uh, measure the proportionality in their policies to, uh, to fulfill uh, the people's rights? Uh, there is a uh, one uh, one principle that uh, uh, Salus Populi Suprema Lex. So uh, the people safe is the higher the highest uh, law in time of of emergency. Okay, that's all my questions. Uh, thank you. Mr. Reza, uh, Mr. Rizky, as a moderator for uh, today. Thank you. Terima kasih Ibu Sonia Siu dari from Universitas Surabaya. 
Uh, okay, we have exit our time. Okay, so please for uh, who 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 is going to answer first? Maybe no. Uh, you? Yeah, yeah. I was hoping to give all the questions to Dr. Ayu because they're so hard. <laughs> they're such hard questions. But uh, let me start start first, and then I would be interested in your opinions too. Uh, uh, so the the question about um, you know Indonesia still being a democracy is a great question. But I think the answer to me is still very simple. I have a very thin definition of democracy. You know, are there elections in which the loser steps down? And you know, so far the answer is yes. Um, more than the United States, actually. Now, um, you know, um, is there freedom of speech and association? Yes. And is there neutral election administration? And the rule of law in the administration, I think the answer is yes. So I think Indonesia is still pretty strong as a constitutional democracy. Um, but just because it meets those things doesn't mean, as you say, that if we were to adopt a thicker definition of democracy, a participation, participatory democracy, deliberative democracy, one of these other more normative ideas, that we could say it was healthy. You know, in, in, from those perspectives, maybe there's much more that can be done. And that's your question about meaningful participation. It's not just a question for Indonesia. It's a question for every constitutional democracy now. Our mechanisms I was uh, for constitutional democracy are basically an 18th century technology. You go to the polling booth once every couple of years. You click something, and then you ign ignore it for two years, or they ignore you. And then two or four years later, you come back and you try again. And that worked in the pre-modern conditions. But in an era of social media, it's totally insufficient to have people feel like they are participating. There's very exciting developments in many countries involving things like citizens' assemblies, where we would take a random group of citizens and ask them to think about a problem. European Union just adopted something like this, Iceland's constitutional process, um, you know, even local level things where you just get people together and we find that people, even if they're deeply divided in voting, when they can meet together in face-to-face -face circumstances, find more agreement than you would think possible. But how does that scale up to a state of a, you know, even a large city, much less a country? Pretty hard. So I just think it's a general problem that you're asking. How do we get more participation? And we know we have some good stories, but it's a general problem that we all face. Um, I will note that the, what we're hearing is that Indonesia has a different problem than other democracies. In my country, we can't pass any legislation. Too much gridlock, so people are frustrated, and they go to the courts. Uh, but in your country, Dr. Ayu is saying, well, they passed too much legislation, too quickly. And people still go to the courts. So that suggests that maybe the courts are now something we should think of as an arena for democratic contestation. If, people, if the 18th century technology of voting for a bunch of legislative representatives seems a little out of date, the court now may have a role. But it will require more creative work by the courts to provide fora, to provide remedies that are attractive and that can facilitate civil society, but don't displace it. So I think it's a great general question of political theory. Dr. Reza, um, so, you know, I'm not sure I have a, I fully get the question. That is, if you have an emergency rule and it has criminal sanctions, they still have to be subject to the principle of legality, right? You still need to find authorization in the law. And to the extent possible, you still have to have procedures in place. A lot of the emergency rules say among the things you cannot do is um, you, you know, punish someone without a regular trial. Even if you have to restrict someone's movement in an emergency, you can't give them criminal sanctions without a regular trial. And so that would be a kind of implementation of the principle of legality. But uh, maybe, maybe you may have to say a little more for it to be clearer for me. Uh, Sonia's question, um, how to deal with proportionality in an emergency law. Yeah, I mean, if you think about it, all of the tough questions are about proportionality. And they're the easy, the easy part. You know, obviously, if it's an emergency, we know that the government you know, has a good purpose fighting the emergency. 
we know that the measures will tend to address that purpose. So those parts of the proportionality test are rather easy. The hard part is assessing whether the restriction on rights is justified given the risks. And the big problem with COVID is no one knew the risks, especially at the beginning. It was very mysterious. Now we can look back, we could say, well, maybe a country like Indonesia didn't need the severe lockdown because of whatever reason. Um, maybe other countries needed more of one. It's not even clear that you have the same same vulnerability in different countries. We don't even know that. So there's just a lot of deep uncertainty. And that deep uncertainty is made even more difficult by the fact that the virus is a smart enemy. We can beat it in one thing and a new variant comes. And so we're just always doing the best we can with this risk regulation. And that probably requires a lot of deference to the government rather than, you know, it's hard for courts to substitute the judgment of the risk for a government. Um, you know, is it really the least restrictive means of restricting rights? Well, maybe in some cases that's easy to figure out, but in a lot of cases it's really hard. So I think proportionality, even though it is the only way we can answer questions of whether measures are appropriate, is also extremely challenging in this particular context. And I look forward to learning more from your, your work on this. Um, uh, I think that's all I'll say. No? Okay. Because, yeah, I think we're now uh, almost uh, the closing time. Uh, unfortunately, yeah, uh, we're almost uh, at, of en at our end of our session today. So, so for Time being, I will, will, I could not and would not uh, conclude uh, and by giving any sub, uh, concluding points. But what I learned that uh, is that that we have so many things to explore, but particularly regarding state of emergency. Yeah, we have some question unanswered regarding the uh, position of court and judicial power within the state of emergency. I think it's uh, important. Uh, topics to ex to be explored more and to be researched more, including by us, University of Indonesia and University uh, Chicago uh, uh, Chicago Law School. And for that, I invite Pak Ari Afriansyah as a, a head of uh, international cooperation to give some remarks regarding the uh, cooperation uh, pro uh, concepts and proposal. All right. Assalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. Um, good uh, afternoon, uh, and also uh, everyone here and everyone in the uh, Zoom uh, meeting room. Uh, thank you very much for the uh, lovely discussion this morning. Professor Tom, Dr. Ayu, and uh, Professor uh, Jimmy has uh, uh, give us uh, enlightenment in terms of the emergency, despite that we have so many, um, what do you call it, um, uh, disagreement in terms of uh, the elements, this in terms of the system, in terms of whatever that we have caused in, in terms of the uh, differences uh, among uh, the countries. However, we face the same thing, uncertainties and also the certainties of the legal system. Those are something that we have to uh, uh, compromise, something that we have to face, and one thing that maybe we, we all as a lawyer do, that the law has always been a reactive. Despite so, we cannot even say that if the law have uh, um, uh, 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 contribute to solve the problem, it doesn't mean that we have, so we have solved the problem actually. We still face another things that we have to solve in the future. So um, I guess uh, on behalf of the faculty of uh, law Universitas Indonesia, we would like to uh, appreciate our highest gratitude to Professor Tom Ginsberg uh, for his presence in our campus. And of course, uh, as the manager of the cooperation, we would like to uh, uh, have a highest uh, hope that our uh, cooperation will not uh, be only this webinar, but also in the future, for uh, a more uh, collaboration in terms of uh, research, publication, 
and even so we can have a maybe a, a, a degree between uh, University of Chicago and Universitas Indonesia and also maybe two other universities that's a ha happening in uh, 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 presence in this uh, meeting as well because uh, we all here are really keen uh, to have a cooperation uh, with foreign partners again uh, thank you so much uh, for uh, participants uh, for your uh, thoughts and discussion and on behalf of the faculty of law in Indonesia uh, hereby I formally uh, close this discussion again thank you very much uh, apologize for any inconvenience. Wassalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh.